minister a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. The love of Christ constraineth us. For we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should henceforth not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, when we come to this table, brethren, we do come here to encourage constraint. That's what we do. And we come to remember the love of Christ as seen through the death of Christ. We are encouraging one another to personal constraint. Okay? The love of Christ constraineth us. Now, some might think that we don't need constraint because, see, we're all saved. We're born again. We're new creatures. God has given us his righteousness. Certainly, we're not saying that we're slaves to sin. We're not saying that. But unfortunately, what you've received from God isn't all you got. It isn't all you got. See, the Nazarenes, that's not true. It's not true that you come to a point sometime now where you don't require constraint. It's not true. As long as you've got a body, you're going to need constraint. Because there is not only the good desires that are making appeals to you, there are corrupt desires. Amen. And if that's not enough, we live in a world that is filled with corruption, that provokes these bad desires. The prophet said, the earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, and that just happens to be the place where you're working out your own salvation. In fact, one of the things that grace teaches us to do in Titus 2.12 is to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That wasn't, that wasn't a word to the world. Grace isn't for the ungodly. It's given to the righteous. They need assistance to deny ungodliness and worldly lust so that they can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. They need that. See? Constraint, I'm going to get a hold of this, constraint means to hold together, which presumes that there's some kind of force trying to draw us apart, some kind of force like that. Constraint isn't necessarily to stop an activity, it's to limit it. It's to provide more focus with it, see? I think of Jesus' words in this regard. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Men on the broad road are there because they have broad affections. And that's why. Did you know one of the things that was said of us before we came to Christ is that we were serving diverse lusts? One man's a shooting off in this direction by covetous. One man's shooting off in this direction because of the fear of the things coming on the world. The lust of other things entering in, and he's shooting off in this direction, all kinds of directions. See, diverse affections makes for a wandering life. Amen. And we happen to have within us the kind of things that is moving these ungodly people to live that way. And there's got to be some way to constrain it so that we can live unto the Lord in all things. Amen. You do have to get to the point, brethren, where you can say like David, this one thing I do. Amen. Or like Paul said, this one thing I do. Amen. See? Now, if you can behold the love of Christ properly... It will constrain you to live for one thing. Okay? The love of Christ constraineth us because what? Because we thus judge. We judge. Other versions say we consider. Another version says we conclude. Okay? The idea is that we're carefully considering 
the death of Christ Jesus. We are carefully looking at this. We are carefully meditating upon this. Because if you do not think much about the death of Christ, you will not be constrained much. It will not happen. An unthinking religion, brethren, makes for diverse living. You wonder why Satan has brought this wake of this entertainment age here? Because it makes for non-thinking people. See? That's what it does. Because if you don't think on the death of Christ, you will not be constrained by it. Amen. We want to think on it. And just as a side note, and I just want to move on from this real quick. Some of the great misunderstanding about the love of Christ is owing to the fact that men don't have the the foundational pillars of the gospel firmly fixed in their minds when they consider the love of Christ. That's why that's happening. That's why there's so much misunderstanding. Because here's what we judge. Fundamental to the gospel. One died for all. It's at the heart of the gospel. One died for for all. That is to say, Jesus died in our place. Or to say it another way, Jesus died as a substitutionary sacrifice for us. Okay? Now, I'm convinced that men would never have come to this conclusion that one could die for all if God had not demonstrated it. So he did. In the law of Leviticus chapter 16, the day of atonement comes. And I'll tell you, you read over chapter 16 of Leviticus, it is astounding how many details are there. It's wonderful. If you're not careful, you can get confused by it because there's so many very specific details that are in there. But that just tells you how hard it is to save a person. It tells you how hard it is. So I'm not going to be able to give you all the details. I'm just going to draw out a couple of things. At the heart of the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement was the offering of two goats. Okay, this was for the sins of the people. Okay. The first thing they did with those goats was not to kill them then to present them. They brought the goats alive. Two goats alive before the tent, the door of the tabernacle by which you would enter in to make the offering, brought it to that door and presented those goats alive to the Lord. Leviticus 16, 7, he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He didn't present them after they died. He did do that later, but here he presented them alive. It's a critical point, critical point. Before we even get to the offering, we've got to first confirm that God has approved the sacrifice. It has to be an approved offering. It's presented, it wasn't presented to men. It wasn't presented to the congregation of Israel. It was presented at the door of the tabernacle because God had to approve it. And it had to be a living, a living goat. In fact, he makes this point of the scapegoat that was provided for the atonement that would be taken out of the congregation, that it was presented alive. Because a life has to be offered for the dead. Dead people can't die for dead people. It has to be alive. Hmm? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But it can't be just the shedding of any blood. It's got to be the shedding of a man that is alive unto God. Amen. And all of us were dead. But he was alive. See, he was alive unto God. To say it another way, Jesus was without sin. Okay, the scripture makes a big point of this, continually makes a big point of this, of his sinless life. Because a sinless life is what was required to put away sins. Okay? For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. 2 Corinthians 5, 12, 21 says it this way. He made him to be sin for us who <laughs> knew no sin. See? And so that was the reason for the presentation there right at the door. Is that God had approved, had approved of this sacrifice. What a marvelous Savior that we have. 
He's the only sinless one. Does that not make his blood that much more precious to us? Yeah. Indeed it does. The love of Christ constraineth us. You see, what I'm getting at is Jesus did not die for his own sins. An important detail on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 6. Before, Ab before Aaron offered one of those lambs upon whom the lot was cast and fell to the one who would be the offering for sin, he would kill that lamb, take its blood in. But before he went in with that blood for the atonement for Israel, he first made an atonement for his own sins. Yes. You remember that young bullock and that ram for a burnt offering? Before he went in to make atonement for the people, he first went in with coals off of the altar, with his hands full of incense, and with the blood not of the goats, but of the young heifer. That's right. Remember that? Important detail, brother. Yeah. I'm telling you, something was a provision was made for Aaron to do what Jesus did not have to do. Okay, you see where I'm, let, let's follow this. So we'd go in there, first thing that he would do was on those coals, he would pour that incense so that there would be a cloud covering over the mercy seat. And then he would sprinkle seven times the blood from that heifer to make an atonement for his own sins. Then he went back out, made the sacrifice, hmm? for the, for the uh, goat to whom the lot had fell, and then bring that in to make an atonement. Now, Paul picks up that point in Hebrews chapter 9 and makes a point of it. And he said this, Into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Now, the point wasn't the physical erection of the tabernacle. It's what happened in the tabernacle that was the point. And here's the point. As long as someone has to go in and make an offering first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, the atonement to which Christ would make has not yet taken place because Jesus did not make an atonement for his own sin because if he had he would have been dying for himself theoretically therefore as a punishment rather than as a propitiation mm -hmm. Jesus was sinless see Amen. the point isn't just that he that God could receive him because he was sinless but that he could now die as a substitute for the rest of the people he did not make an offering for his own sin. And so he goes on to say, neither by the blood of goats and calves, this is verse 12, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. Well, that's marvelous. One dies for all. Well, you know what that confirms, brethren? All were dead. If there was ever a reason not to embrace this notion of limit atonement, here it is. First, he flat off just says, he died for all. In fact, this point is made. He is a propitiation, not only for our sins, he says, but for the sins of the whole world. You know why that's so significant? Because the death of Christ confirms that there is not a man in the world that is alive to God. Amen. It confirms it. If one died for all, then all were dead. Mm -hmm. That's right. yeah, yeah. What does that mean? It means like the prophet said, Behold, I looked, and there was none to help. There was none to make intercession. They are all together profitless. There is none righteous no, not one. So we're on the horns of a dilemma, brethren, because none in our race can intercede not to take care of your own sins, let alone the sins for the rest of humanity. You know what this proves? This proves how merciful God is. 
For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. See? It's because of his great love where he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. Now, I think that's, that's a marvelous thing to behold. Jesus died in our stead. He didn't suffer for his own sins. He suffered for our sins when we could do nothing about it. So here we are, brethren. Salvation is unto God and unto the Lamb. Because we know exactly where we were when he saved us. Let's thank God for what he's done. It's a marvelous offering he's made. Father,